You lot, there, wake up. Get me one of Hector's guards or any one of his soldiers. Go inside and tell Hector there's news he must hear. We're the fourth watch who patrol our front line. Hector, Hector, wake up. <clears throat> Either sit up and listen or just lean onto your elbow. Come on, Hector, open those fearsome eyes of yours and come out. Who is it? Friend or foe? What is the watchword? Speak quickly now. What men come to my sleeping quarters in the middle of the night? Speak! This is the army's guards, Hector. What's all this rushing about? What's all this noise? Be not, Hector. Me? Fear? I fear nothing. What is it? A night raid? No, not a raid, but... Well then, what? Why did you leave your post unattended, soldier? Why you rush over here with so much noise, waking up the whole camp if you have nothing to report? Don't you know that the Greeks are camped just out there? Can't you see we're sleeping in full armour to be ready for them? Arm yourself indeed, Hector. Arm yourself and go over to where our allies are sleeping. Come and wake them up! Order them to get themselves armed, Hector. All of them! Send some of your close mates to our soldiers and get them to get their horses ready. What? What are you saying? Some of your words and fear and others' courage. There's nothing clear in them. You haven't been stung by Pan's prick, have you, Cronus' son? Is that what made you so frightened? You get up and leave your post unattended, rush over here and send the army into disarray with silly stories. What on earth are you telling us? What am I to make of this odd report? So many words and none of them saying anything that I can understand. Hector, listen. The Greeks have fires lit up everywhere, right through the whole night. You can see the moorings of all their ships from here and everyone is milling around Agamemnon's tent. There's noisy business taking place in there. I've come to you because I'm afraid of what they might have in store for us, not because I need to be reprimanded by you. Ah, a rather frightening report. Still, you have come just at the right time. It seems the Argives want to escape from me, run off, even while my eyes are watching them. They want to get away from our land in those ships of theirs under the wide cover of darkness. Now, I know what all these fires are about. Oh, gods, you have robbed me of my feast as you would rob a lion of its kill. A feast of the whole Argive army with this spear. Had the rays of the sun not vanished... I would have continued until my glorious spear had set fire to all their ships, destroyed all their tents, and with this murderous hand, slaughtered a horde of them. My heart was urging me on, that's for certain. I wanted to keep up the pace that the gods have given me and to go on killing through the night, but the seers, our wise men who know the ways of the gods, convinced me to wait until the new light and then leave no Achaean alive. Well then... We must rush. Wake up the army and get it ready. Hurry! Spear those cowards in their backs as they try to climb onto their ships. Paint their ladder bridges red with their own blood. Hold it, Hector. Don't be in such a rush. We don't know if they are really trying to escape. What else would they be doing with all these fires? I don't know, Hector. But I am a little afraid. Afraid? If you're afraid of a little thing like this, then you must be terrified of everything. Our guides have never lit fires like that before. Nor have they ever suffered such a devastating defeat as the one they suffered yesterday, either. Oh, thanks to you, Hector, yes. But now think of what we should do next. What we should do next is simple. With enemies, my command is always, grab a spear. Sir, what is going on? Why have the night guards come here to your camp in such a panic? Lumius, get yourself fully armed and ready for attack. The Greeks are jumping onto their ships. They're getting away. What makes you say that? What have you seen? Tell me. They've been burning huge fires all night, Aeneas, so I don't think they'll still be here in the morning. Once they burn all their torches, they'll jump aboard their well-benched ships and sail away for home. And you? Why the spear in your hand? 
I'll be using it against them while they're trying to jump aboard their ship. Spear them hard in the back. That should stop them. It'd be a great shame for us, a cowardly thing to do, to reject the goodwill of the gods who have handed to us these enemies. Oh, Hector. If only your eagerness to fight were combined with wisdom enough to make good plans, but... I suppose men can't be perfect at everything. Your talent is fighting. Thinking is a talent that others have. So you saw the fires burning and you immediately thought that the enemy is leaving. So now you want to take your army there, trying to get through the deep moats in the middle of the night? Yeah, impossible. But still, let us say that you did manage to cross those moats. What if when you do that, you are faced with the fact that the enemy is not sailing off, but is right there? in front of you, all ready and prepared for your spears. Hector, if you lose that battle, you'll never make it back here again. And even still, uh, let's say that you did win that battle. There would still be an Achilles there, you know, Peleus' son waiting just for you. And he's not going to let you set fire to the ships and he's not going to let you just kill the Achaeans the way that you think you will. That man, is a raging fireball in battle. Let's just send a, a spy over there to the enemy line, some volunteer to check on them, see if they really are trying to escape. And if we find that they are, well then, then we can charge at them. But if the Argives are using these fires to trick us, then we'll learn even more about our enemy's tactics and then respond accordingly. Hector, I think he's right. Best if you do as he says, rather than as you think. I hate it when the leadership of General stands on unsafe ground. All right, Aeneas, you win. The majority agrees with you. Now, Aeneas, go and pacify our allies because the army might feel a bit uneasy if they hear we're having meetings like this in the night. I'll send a spy myself to check out what the Greeks are up to. Your camp is nearby, so if we hear anything, you'll know about it quickly. But if we see that they're jumping aboard their ships, you'll know about it through a trumpet call. I won't be coming around to you. I'll be rushing over there this very night. Right. Yes, well, now you're being sensible. Do send someone over there immediately. As for me, when the time comes, uh, you'll see me acting just as bravely as you. Well then, men, you've heard what we need. Who will do this great service to our nation? I can't serve everyone all the time, both Trojans and allies. I will. I am willing to do it. I will go to the ships of the Achaeans, find out what they're planning to do, and then come back here and tell you about it. Ah, our very own Dolon. Your name does justice to your nature, my wily friend, and a man who loves his country too. Yes, excellent. But do let me ask you, shouldn't a man's work be rewarded in some way? I will certainly work for my country and perform this task, but a task is twice as sweetly done if there's a reward attached. Quite right. Quite right. Name your reward, Dolon. Ask for anything except my throne. Throne? No, keep your throne, Hector. I've no wish at all to be king. Ah, uh, I know. Join our household. Marry one of Priam's daughters. No. <laughs> No marriage above my station, Hector. Gold then, Dolon. We have an abundance of that. So do we, Hector. We lack no wealth either. What then, Dolon? What else can Troy offer you? The reward will be given after we destroy the Greeks. Name it. Anything except their chiefs. They're all yours to slaughter, Hector. We'll put you among the first to choose from the spoils. You can come and pick whatever you like. Spoils? No, you can hang on to those columns of temples. Dedicate them to the gods. Well, what's better than all these things I've offered you, Dolon? What more do you want from me? Achilles' horses, Hector. Oh no, those horses, Dolon. You and I both love them. Immortal beasts sired by immortals and ridden by the fast-footed Achilles, son of Peleus. They say it was Poseidon who had given them to Peleus as a wedding gift. But? I won't start reneging on my promise now. I will give you Achilles' horses as well as his chariot. The task is huge, Dolon, but so are the rewards. If you succeed, Dolon, you'll be among the blessed. So far as the gods are concerned, justice herself will decide this, but so far as mortals are concerned, well, you've got it all, Dolon. Yes, well, I'll be off now. 
I'll go home first and change into clothes that are more appropriate for the task. Change into what sort of clothes, Dolan? Clothes fit for a covert operation. Wolf skin on my back with its gaping jaws over the top of my head, four legs over my shoulders, hind legs around my feet. And while I'm approaching the moat and the walls around their ships, I'll walk on all fours to make it hard for the Greeks to detect me. But when I get out onto open land, I'll stand up and walk on my two feet. I hope Hermes, the god of thieves, Maya's son, will help you get there and back. I will get there safely, kill Odysseus and bring you his head as proof that I, Dolon, have gotten to the Greek ships. Or perhaps I'll kill Diomedes, Tydeseus' son. In any case, I'll be back before the break of dawn with my hands dripping blood. Hi, welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy Online. My name is Lana Coley and I am filling in briefly for Joel Christensen who should be returning any moment. He's had a, an internet glitch. I'm delighted to be here with Mary Ebbett from the College of the Holy Cross. And uh, Mary, it's, it's great to have you talking with us today about Euripides Rhesus. Um, what's, what's something that you think people should know when they're going to read this play, which is not something that's normally taught in classes or, or a very often read play? And here's Joel. <laughs> he is back. <laughs> Thanks, Lana. Hi. Sorry to leave everybody in the lurch. We had, um, I don't know, Hector sneaked in and destroyed my internet access. <laughs> um, so have we welcomed everybody to the show? No, no let's welcome everyone. All right, so welcome everybody to my late arrival. I'm Joel Christensen from Brandeis University here with Mary Ebbett from College of the Holy Cross. And we're really excited to bring you uh, Reading Greek Tragedy Online. This week, we're here with um, a play that all of us love to hate and hate to love, um, which is Euripides uh, uh, Rhesus. Now this play, um, as we'll talk about only in brief, is not always attributed to uh, Euripides, um, but it is a play that's worth considering as being his. The actors we just saw um, were Tim DeLapp, Tabitha Gale, Evelyn Miller, and Paul Omani. Um, and this play is, uh, takes place in a part of the Trojan War we don't always hear a lot of, but appears in book 10 of the Iliad. Um, and you know, it's basically the scene where Odysseus and Diomedes slip away in the night, murder some people in their sleep. Um, Hector also tries to send someone off to spy on them. Uh, spoiler alert, he gets murdered. Um, and it's one of these scenes um, that causes a lot of strong emotions. So before we get to the play, Mary, I, I did warn you. Um, can you give me sort of like, what's your elevator pitch about book 10 of the Iliad? Uh, well, book 10 of the Iliad um, is just as traditional about as, every, as any other part of the Iliad, um, but it is its own distinct theme, right? And, and this play reflects a lot of that as well, right? So um, it's a theme about action at night um, that Casey Duay, Duay and I have um, labeled an ambush theme, right? But so many of the things that, um, that happen in this play and that happen in book uh, 10, um, you know, have to do with um, covert operations, if we can put it that way, right? So ambush or spying missions, right? We just sent Dolan off on a spying mission. Um, We'll hear more about ambush as the play goes on. Um, but it could also have things to do like cattle rustling or other kinds of uh, actions that, that take place in the dark and aren't open battle, right? And so one of the things that, that people should know about how this play is interesting and unusual is that it is supposed to be taking place in the dark. Right, it is supposed to be um, at night, which is unusual for the action of, of Greek tragedy, as well as within the epic, which is what makes, makes book 10 different. It's also unusual in that it, it reproduces an episode that we have in the Iliad. So a lot of our plays that have to do with the Trojan War have to do with parts of that story and parts of that tradition 
that are outside what the Iliad itself covers, so to speak, right? What it includes. And yet the rhesus is the same action as what we have in Iliad 10, um, but it does give us more of the Trojan point of view yeah. of it, right? Yeah, and so because in the Iliad we do we do get Hector talking to Dolon and giving yep. and promising the horses, so that's there. Yep. And so I think one of the reasons why people find both suspect may be because there's so much alignment. Um, mm. But I think if you come fresh from one to the other, it's pretty clear how different they are too, right? Um, so one significant difference is the character Rhesus, the king, is a huge personage in Euripides. Um, and he's just sort of a there in the Iliad. We don't really meet him. He's asleep and he's killed in Iliad. <laughs> <laughs> well, all we really I, need is for Rhesus to die. Yeah. Right. And I think so. And, and, you know, I'd love to hear your response to this. I think one of the reasons why people find both plays suspect is because of modern notions of heroism mm -hmm. um, and misreadings of it. Right. People don't like the fact that Odysseus and Diomedes murder people in their sleep. Right. Yeah. You know? Yes, absolutely. I agree with you. And, and I think that, um, again, what, what Casey and I were exploring in our um, book was, was some of that notion. And, um, but how ambush is uh, portrayed within the epic tradition as what the best do, right? The, uh -huh. And so it's not meant to be negative or cowardly or anything, right? It's, it's, First of all, it's hard. It's hard to, to be a success, to successfully do a spying mission or an ambush at night. And, you know, so we have Achilles, you know, say to Agamemnon, you never go on ambush, right? With the rest of us. And, and we have all, that, yeah. I think we also end up with rather strange notions about violence and masculinity when mm -hmm. we aren't actually engaged in it. So something I'm all, I think of often is I have a friend whose father was a Marine. And one of the things he always said was, anybody who gets in a fight with his fist is an idiot. Right? <laughs> he said, look, pick up any weapon, do anything you can, right? It's not manly to fight with your fist, it's just dumb. And so, I mean, you know, so I think there's this idea that uh, there's this idealized one-on-one -on -one warrior thing in the Iliad, right? Um, and I think what I like about your work with Casey um, is that you say, well, that's something we're putting on the Iliad. It's not necessarily there, right? right. So these themes are things that make people sort of stop and, and pause. Um, but there's also some stuff about the style and form of this play um, that's a little strange. Can you speak to any of that? Yeah, so I mean, uh, uh, there's um, some questions again about just the the subject matter, but there's also um, questions about the tone. And I think one of the scenes we're going to to see performed um, later, you know, is is any of this supposed to be comic in any way? Right? There's you know some of those questions as well. Um, but I think, you know, that when you look at what we know of Euripides, he is certainly willing to um, push those boundaries, yeah. right? And he, he blends genres and, and he, he sort of has a very meta theatrical interrogation of stories, right? In terms of what belongs and, and what doesn't. But again, I think that often the approach to this play is, I don't get it. And so therefore it can't be authentic <laughs> or I don't like it and therefore it can't be authentic. And, and we both know various schools of classical <laughs> scholarship that make those feelings central to their approaches. Um, I and mean, when I was reading it, I was thinking, well, there's not really a real chorus in this play. It's not fully mm -hmm. developed. Um, and it's not nearly as quotable as other Euripidean plays. Now that is not a hard and fast or a really um, rigorous test at all. But you're right about, you're absolutely right about the tone. Euripidean tone is all over the place and challenging. Um, in, in looking at the play and the performance, what are some things you'd suggest that people look for to really get a sense of what makes this play special? Yeah, so I think one of the things that we're seeing from the very, very beginning here in, in that opening scene that um, was just performed so beautifully are some of the big questions that, um, that Euripidean tragedy um, 
explores in different ways and in different plays, but they're here. And, and the fact that we're in the dark um, sort of makes them manifest, right? And there's this whole crisis of knowledge, how we know things, can we know things, um, and what that means in terms of being suspicious, being mistrustful, acting before you know what's going on, right? Um, that will lead to tragedy. But, uh, <laughs> but so we have the very first thing, right? That Hector says, are you friend or foe, yeah. right? I can't see who's talking to me. I don't have sure knowledge of whether you are my friend or my enemy. And that goes throughout this whole play, right? is I think you're my ally, but are you? I saw somebody in the dark, I couldn't figure out who he was. And we see that in other places in Euripides with um, you know, people who we can see who they are, but we're not sure about their intentions. And so here I see you know, that this is exploiting the whole darkness and the difficulty of, of using visual recognition in the dark to explore some of those same ideas about how do we know what we think we know and so this whole argument about what do those fires that we can see over in the Greek camp what does that mean what's going on over there and how will we be able to find out enough to know how to act how to react to that right and so you get this argument back and forth about you know, well, let's just go and attack, right? They're trying to get away. And, and this feeds into, um, you know, this characterization of Hector. He doesn't want to let the Greeks leave. And you would think after 10 years of war, like, yeah, let them leave. Like, let them go. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> yeah. And instead, he sort of ratcheted up the, um, the, the terms of the war and the, you know, the, what's at stake to mean I have to annihilate them. I can't just let them end the war by leaving, right? And, and that's happening in the Iliad at this point in the story too. So, the Trojans are out because they don't want to let the Greeks leave, but isn't, isn't, what does that say about sort of how we're making decisions? So we, we had a great conversation last week with Lynn Kozak about the character of Hector, and I want to come back to him after we get to watch this portrayal. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll have a couple scenes in a row um, and then we'll come back and we'll get a greater chance, a longer chance to talk. What happens in this bit that we're missing um, is that the chorus sings to Apollo to guide Dolon safely through the Argive camp and back again. Um, and then a messenger arrives on the scene bringing Hector news of Rhesus's imminent approach, which again is different from the Iliad where Rhesus is already there. The Thracian king comes in style, according to the messenger, um, who pays, pays special attention to the armor and the chariot of the new arrival. And in the scene, um, we'll see Hector and Rhesus together for the first time. Let Zeus's daughter, Adrasteia, who punishes the conceited, keep my words safe from divine anger. I will utter only such things as are anxiously waiting in my heart to be uttered. Son of our river, Rhesus, you have arrived. You have come near the palace that prays to Zeus, the god of friendship, and the palace welcomes you. It's taken too long for your mother, the muse, Piraea, and for your father, Strymon, the river of many splendid bridges, to send you here. It was this beautiful river, Strymon himself, who wound his waters through the pure gulfs of your mother, the muse, the melodious singer. And with his seed, she gave birth to you, a glorious youth. I see you as if you were Zeus, giver of light, entering our city on a chariot behind your spotted mares. Will the day come, I wonder, when the old Troy will reemerge? The Troy with her lover's secret hideaways, her joyful singing, her drinking parties where the wine was passed from hand to hand, drinking parties that lasted all day long. Will the day come when the Atreus brothers leave our shores, leave us 
and head back for their own homes in Sparta after sailing through the wide ocean. Oh, Brissus, my friend, how I wish you could accomplish this dream of mine. Come, my friend, appear before Achilles' face and raise your golden shield to him. Urge fast your horses, shake your two-sprung spear at him. No enemy shall escape you. No enemy shall ever see the day when he can dance at the plains of the temple of Hera the Argive. No, he shall die a death by a Thracian spear, and this soil shall welcome the weight of his corpse, and will take it with delight. Oh, Thrace, what a magnificent man you have raised, a truly glorious prince. Oh, admire the golden armour that covers his body. Oh, Listen to the boisterous clang of the bells that hang from the rims of his shield, the son of our river, Strymon, and amuse. Oh, Troy, this god has come to breathe courage into your soul. Noble Hector, noble son of a noble father, king of this land. Uh, this is a belated greeting I am addressing you, I know, but oh, but I am pleased that you are winning this war. And I'm here to help you tear down their walls and set fire to their ships. Rhesus, noble son of the muse of Melody and of the Thracian river Strymon, my way is to always tell the truth. I'm not a two-faced man. Your duty was to come here a long time ago and fight with all your might for Troy. Stop the Argive spears from destroying her. And no, you can't use the excuse that you were not invited and that's why you didn't come to see your friends any earlier, to help them in their hour of need. We have sent to you numerous envoys and embassies of elders to try and persuade you to come and protect our city. We have even sent you rich gifts of honor. But you, even though you are of the same race as us, a barbarian from barbarian stock, you have betrayed us. Yes, you have betrayed us to the Greeks by your delays. Was it not this very hand of mine that has made you the great king of Thrace that you are now? Had I not thrown myself against the shields of the bravest men of Thrace, and had I not smashed their lines around Pangeum in the land of the Paeonians, you would still be one of their petty chieftains. And you, how did you repay me for that deed? You have brushed it aside, and instead of showing us gratitude, you have left the task of coming to help your friends until it's too late until their difficult days have passed. There are men here who are total foreigners, totally unrelated to us, men who've been here for a long time. Some of them have even died here and their bodies lie in graves on our own soil. Now that's real proof of their loyalty us, to, to us, to our Troy. There, I, Hector, speak like a free man and I speak only the truth. I have made my complaints to you personally and openly. Hector, I am the same. My words are straight. There's no double meaning in them. You'll find no forked paths in my speech. My heart, Hector, suffered even more than yours because I wasn't here. I grieved more painfully than you, but as I was preparing to come over here, the Scythians, my neighbors, decided to attack me. I was about to cross the hostile Black Sea with my men when there, at the shore, the spear of war soaked the soil with much of our Thracian blood, as well as that of the Scythians. But that's what stopped me from crossing over and heading for the plains of Troy to come here and help you. I won that war, and then afterwards I took their children as hostages and set an annual tax for them to pay me. It was after I've completed those tasks that I set off again for here. 
First, I took the sea with a ship, crossed over, and then walked through all the other lands. I've neither slept in a golden palace nor drank those deep draughts that you're prattling on about. Instead, I had to put up with icy blasts that hit the frozen sea across Thrace and Paedonia with only these clothes here for a blanket, not a wink of sleep. I know I am late, but there is still time. You've been playing the dice of war against the Argives for the last 10 years, and you have still not won the war? Now, all I ask of you is to give me the sunlight of a single day, and I'll have those towers of theirs tor torn down, attack their dockyards, and kill all the Greeks. None of you will need to raise a shield, because even though I'm a late arrival, with this spear, I will kill all those Argives, all those Greeks who've been boasting so loudly about their bravery. A man like you, Rhesus. No warship, no Greek ship of war has ever brought a man better than you. Not ever before, and not now. I don't know how Achilles or even Ajax will be able to cope with your spear, my lord. And as a recompense for my long delay in coming here, which has caused you such great offense, I'll give you another gift. Provided, of course, the goddess Agistrea approves of what I'm about to say. When we have freed Troy from the attacks of the Greeks, and after you have made offerings to the gods from the best of the spoils, I want you, Hector, you and I together, to go to Greece and with this spear punish them. Punish the whole country. Teach them all what it is to suffer. I will be very thankful to the gods if I just get out of this disaster alive and well, and get to rule beautiful Troy in safety again as I did before. As for destroying Argos and the rest of Greece with your spear, well, I don't think that would be such an easy task. Don't people say that these men who came here are the finest Greece has to offer? I see nothing wrong with them. It's been tough work fighting them. Well then, if we kill them all, all of this lot, won't that be the end of Greece? Rhesus, forget about what's in the distance. Focus on what's near. Hector, I think you're happy to go on suffering like this instead of doing something about it. Listen, Rhesus, my power is large enough as it is here. Now, you can camp whichever side of the field you want, left, right, or in the middle of our other allies, if you like. Rest your shield and your men wherever you like. No, Hector. I want to fight the Greeks all on my own. However, if you think it a great embarrassment to have their ships suddenly... After 10 years of hard fighting, burnt to cinders, if that is too embarrassing for you, then simply set me up to fight against Achilles and his army. Not possible. You can't fight against him and his frenzied spear. He's not fighting. Ah, uh, well, who's the next best among them? To my mind, Ajax is no lesser than Achilles, nor is the son of Tydeus. And Odysseus is a sly and bold rascal who's caused more pain to this city than any of the others. Brave men fight the enemy out in the open, Hector. Not in secret. This man you're talking about, this man who does all of his fighting with sly tricks and secret hiding places, I will catch him alive. Impale him through his spine and set him up as a feast for the vultures outside the city. That's the sort of death that a common thief and a temple robber deserves. Come. For now, go and rest. It's still dark. I'll show you where you and your army can settle for the night. It'll be separate from the rest of us. Now, if we ever need it... The watchword is Phoebus. So with that, we're about to shift to the other side of the battlefield to see what sort of shenanigans are being prepared there. Um, in between, or as we move from one scene to another, there's a change of the watch. So this uh, password is important. The course of soldiers have a moment of confusion. Um, they exit the scene and they leave room for the stealthy contingent of Achaeans to make their entrance. And we'll find out what kind of man this scoundrel Odysseus is. Diomedes? What was that noise? Is that a clash of swords my ears picked up or was it something unimportant? Nothing important, Odysseus. Some horse's harness hit against the rails of a chariot. Right. Careful you don't bump out uh, onto any guards in the dark. 
I always walk carefully. But what if you do? What if you wake someone up? Do you know the watchword they use? Yes, Odysseus, it's Phoebus. Fe don't Fe run, Phoebus? Me. Phoebus, look here. Enemy beds, no one in them. Yes, Dolon told me there'd be no one here. This is where Hector sleeps. My sword is ready for him. I wonder what it means. Could they be setting up some ambush for us? Probably. Cooking up no, some scheme somewhere, no doubt. Now that Hector is on a winning streak, nothing will stop him. He's become very daring, our Hector. So what do we do now, Odysseus? The man is clearly not in his tent so well. There go our hopes of capturing him. I think we'd better hurry back to our ships. The man is being protected by the same god that's giving, giving him all these victories. Why don't we go over and, with these swords, cut off the head of Aeneas, as well as that of Paris, the Trojan I hate the most? It's too dark, and Diomedes, too risky and too difficult to find them. This, this here is their camping ground. But it's a shame to go back to the ships without inflicting some pain upon our enemy. What do you mean some pain, Diomedes? What if would cause great pain to the enemy. Aren't these Dolon's belongings? <laughs> Haven't we killed their precious Dolon who is spying on our ships? Did you expect we destroy their whole army tonight? All right, I believe you. Let's go back. And good luck in doing that. Are you two leaving the Trojan camp? Is your heart disappointed because the gods did not permit you to kill Hector in Paris? Well, listen, Theseus has come to Troy, and oh, with what great pomp. Now, if that man survives this night, neither Ajax nor Achilles with their spears will be able to hold him back. However, if you manage to kill him, if you kill him, you win the lot. The war is yours. So forget about Hector and his tent, and you forget about chopping off his head. Hector's death is destined to come from someone else's hand. Ah! <laughs> it's my lady! Oh, Athena! Your voice! I hear it and I recognize it. You're always by my side, lady. Oh, always helping me, always there when I have some painful task to perform. Tell me, my goddess, where's this man, this, this Rhesus, set up his bed tonight? Not far from here. He's placed away from all the others, from all the Trojans. Hector separated him from the rest, at least until day takes over from night. He's easy to find. White horses are harnessed to Thracian chariots next to him, and those horses shine like the wings of a swan, so you can see them in the dark, kill their owner, and they're yours. To take home as spoils of war. Diomedes, Either you kill the soldiers, or you let me do that, while you take care of the horses. No, I'll take care of the killing, and you take care of the horses. You're the one with the clever head, you know all the tricks. Ah! I can see Paris Alexandros heading this way. He must have heard from a guard that there are enemy soldiers in their midst. Well then, here's the man to slaughter. Diomedes? No. Your strength does not surpass that of fate, and this man's fate declares that his death will not come by your hand but by that belonging to someone else. Now run to the place where you are fated to slaughter someone else. I'll stay here and make this man who is my own personal enemy think that I am his friendly little goddess, Aphrodite, who's come to help him with his troubles. Hector. Hector, my commander. Hector. Brother, are you asleep? There are enemy soldiers around Thebes, maybe, or spies. Courage, Paris. I, Aphrodite, love you and I'm always looking out for you. I'm watching over your war with interest and I will never forget the honor you have bestowed upon me for which I thank you greatly. Yes, you have always stood by me and by my city, Aphrodite. I'm proud to say that the greatest deed I have done for Troy was to judge you the winner of the beauty contest. I've heard, not clearly, I must admit, some rumor among the guards that there are Greek spies in our camps. It's unclear. One guard says they're here, but he hasn't seen them. 
and another says he's seen them come, but could tell me no more. <laughs> Don't worry about a thing, Paris. There's nothing troublesome going on in the camp. Hector has just gone to take the army off, the, the army of the Thracian allies, to where they can set up camp for the night. Fine, Aphrodite. Your words have convinced me. So I'll just go back and stand guard at my spot. I'm no longer worried. <laughs> go ahead, Paris. Go. <laughs> and remember that I, Aphrodite, am watching over you all the time. I want nothing more than to see that my friends are happy, and you will soon see proof of that. Now, you men, you brave, brave men, Odysseus, son of Laertes, let your sharpened blade rest. Rhesus, the Thracian general, has been killed. His horses now belong to you. However, the Trojans now know that you're here and they're on their way, so you'd better run off back to your ships. Quickly! So with that pretty hilarious sequence of events, um, we're set up for the impending slaughter. Um, Athena has played the role of multiple goddesses um, and we're setting both sides up to engage in the middle of this dark field. Um, so as the, once our cameras go off and we're moving on to the next scene, uh, Odysseus and Diomedes narrowly avoid the chorus and they give the password, they torture it out of Dolon, Phoebus. Um, and they deceive the soldiers into letting them by. The chorus realize that they've been deceived and then they sing of their prior encounters with this wonderful chap named Odysseus. The chariot driver is heard from, from offstage and then enters wounded and in distress and he relates the offstage events including a dream of his own. Rhesus's fine horses mounted and tormented by wolves. The chariot driver awoke in time to hear Rhesus murdered in the dark and to be wounded himself when he attempted to defend his king. You lot, you have acted outrageously. How is it that the spies have managed to go past you without noticing? Disgraceful stuff. These spies have slaughtered by sword so many of our men without you bothering them at all. Not when they came in and not when they went out. Who else but you could be responsible for this? Be certain of this, though. I swear by Zeus, father of all, that for this deed you shall be dealt with, either the whip with the whip or with the executioner's axe, or else you can call Hector a coward. Great Hector, defender of our city. No! These men must have snuck in here when I had come to you with the warning that the Greeks were burning watch fires near their ships. <laughs> Why are you threatening them and why are you trying to twist my words? You are a barbarian just like me. Neither of us is Greek. The person to blame is you and both the dead as well as the wounded know it and they will blame no one else. You will need to make a huge speech to me, a speech that has a whole lot of clever words in it. If you want to convince me that it wasn't you who slaughtered these men, you and your own allies and they did it because they wanted to steal those horses. Why else would you have begged your allies to come over here? Uh, why else would you have had them killed? So they come here and now they are dead. You murdered them yourself. Not even Paris has disgraced the hearth of hospitality so shamelessly. Not even he has murdered his allies. And don't tell me it was some Greeks who did it. How could they? How could they have passed through the dense line of the Trojan army without them having been seen by anyone? Tell me then, but which one of your, your mates has been wounded or slaughtered by these Greek soldiers? None? No, it was I and other Thracians who suffered the wounds and the murder. In plain words, Hector, no Greek is to blame for this. How could a Greek find his way to Rhesus's bed through the darkness of the night unless uh, he had some god helping him? The Greeks didn't even know Rhesus was here. From the moment that the Greeks have set foot on this land, I had allies all around me and I have never been accused by any of them of anything. You were the first. No. This is the work of Odysseus. It is his doing all right. And Dolon, would Odysseus have got to him as well? I don't know which Odysseus you're talking about. The hand that struck us was not that of an enemy. By all means, think what you like, Thracian. Oh, Thrace. 
Oh, my homeland. I wish I could die there. Don't wish death upon yourself. We have seen enough death already. I have lost my master. Where can I turn to now? You can turn to my house. There, you will be welcomed and healed. How can I be healed by murderous hands? Will this man not stop repeating himself? Curses to the murderer! Take him away, men. Take him to my house and treat him better than he would be treated anywhere else. Why is it that the gods bring us such misery after such victory? What are they up to? My lord, look, what goddess is this above us? She, she's, she's carrying the corpse of some newly slaughtered man. Don't be afraid to look, Trojans. It is I, the muse, the goddess most honoured by the wise men, one of the nine sisters. I have come here because I saw my son shamefully murdered by his enemies. Odysseus, the man who has murdered him, will be punished appropriately in the near future. I mourn your death, my son, with my own words of grief. What a journey you had, my son, my darling, to this city. What a dreadful trip it was, my son, my darling, the trip which your father and I begged you not to take. Death to the son of Odysseus and death to the son of Laertes, who has killed my noble son and left me childless. Death too to the woman who abandoned her house in Greece to come and lie in a Phrygian bed and have you killed my son, my darling. Death to her who has emptied myriads of cities of their brave sons. In life and in the halls of Hades, son of Philemon, you have heaped bitterness in my heart. It was your impertinence, Theramus, the impertinence you have shown against the muses by challenging them that has destroyed you and has made me the mother of this unfortunate boy. But you, my son, my darling son, when I had given birth to you, I felt great shame towards my sisters because I was a virgin. And so I plunged you into the splendid swirling waters of your father, he, in turn, handed you to the nymphs of the springs. These virgins had raised you, my son, raised you well, and so you became the first of men, the king of the Thracians. I had no fear that you'd die while you fought all of those bloody battles for the sake of your own country, my son, but I knew well your fate with Troy. But a constant stream of ambassadors and pleas from Hector had convinced you to come here and to help your friend. But no, the cause of all this disaster is you, Athena. Even though Odysseus and Diomedes committed the deed, the real culprit is you. Don't think that I don't know this, Athena. You did this. Even though my sister Muses and I often visit Athens, your city, and honour it more than all the others. It was Orpheus, Athena, this young man's cousin, who had initiated your city to the secret mysteries. And Musius too, Athena. He was trained by us, the Muses, and by Phoebus Apollo. And the prize for all that is that here I am now with the corpse of my son in my arms, singing a dirge over his murder. See, Hector, the Thracian chariot driver was wrong to accuse us of committing those murders. That I knew already. We needed no wise prophet to tell us that this was the work of Odysseus. As for the accusations against me, how could I not act as I did? The moment I saw the Greeks setting up camp on our soil, I sent heralds to all of my friends asking them to help Troy. It's true, I've also sent some to Rhesus, and he felt obliged to help me, and that's why he came here. But his death fills me with great sorrow, and so now I shall prepare the funeral he deserves. The Black Earth will not take my son. I will ask the virgin Persephone 
daughter of Demeter, giver of fruit, to let my son's soul remain here on earth. She is obliged to show me that she truly honours all friends of Orpheus. And of course, to me, he will be just like any other man who has died and cannot see the light of day. He will never see me. He will live hidden in the caves of the silver rich land, able to see sunlight and acting as the prophet of Bacchus and be revered as a god by those who have the knowledge. My grief will be felt less than that felt by Thetis, the sea goddess who, fate declares, will also lose her son, Achilles. Apollo's quiver contains an arrow reserved just for him, for Achilles. Ah, the pains and miseries that mortal parents must endure. Anyone who thinks about these troubles will never have children. They will never give birth only to bury them. Rhesus mother will mourn for her child. But you, Hector, you must do what you think must be done. We stand by your side. Hurry then. Go to our allies and tell them to get ready. When I have crossed the moat and the Greek walls, I will set fire to their ships. Of that I am certain, and I am certain that the first rays of today's sun will bring to us a day of freedom. Come then. We must obey our king. Let us pick our arms and go to deliver this command to our allies. Perhaps the God who looks after us will grant us victory. So, Mary, how oh, good you joined me here. I find myself just so blown over by the tonal shifts in that play that I don't even know where I am. And I think one of the reasons why we let it all run together today was to get an experience of those shifts yeah. and, and let us try to reflect on it. Um, so I have a whole bunch of questions. Um, I don't know if you can answer them, but before I even start assaulting you with them, um, what are your, some of your responses or your questions that emerge from watching the play as we just did? Yeah, I do think that performance um, really helps bring out so much in this play that if you're just reading it, I think it's even harder to get a hold on, on the tone. Um, and as we talked about, you know, before Euripides, plays with tone, he's, you know, not, not shy about that. And so I think one question might be in seeing Odysseus and Diomedes as, you know, sort of these, um, you know, more comic figures, does that actually add to a tragic effect, right? In, in some way when we shift back to that. And so I think of something like uh, Euripides Alcestis, right, where you have sort of the comic Heracles, but then, you know, the real, the real tragedy there too. And so, um, but uh, I, I really like that because it points to this, this problem of perspective and judgment, right? I mean, is Odysseus a, you know, a scheming manipulator? Um, or is he just manic and, and clever? Right? And I really like, so what, what, Diomedes and Odysseus in this play reminded of me of were the characters played by Johnny Depp and Benito del Toro in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, right? These two people just totally blitzed out, right? Somehow making it through things um, and living through the end. Um, and so that, that was a really neat scene because it definitely takes away the scheming. And uh, we'll talk to the actors about that in a, in a bit. Um, but the, the tonal move from that to the mourning at the end, mm -hmm. um, I think to make some sense of it. Um, perhaps you could tell me a little more about the myth of Rhesus um, and where he is as a character, because to me, he's just a character in the background of the Iliad, right? right. Um, but here it's clear that there's some, that there's a story tradition behind him. Um, so what's going on? What's Euripides drawing on that I don't know? Yeah, so there is um, a much wider uh, background to Rhesus than you would certainly know from just reading um, the Iliad. And certain lines within the scenes that we looked at sort of point to some of that. Um, and then 
you know, as we'll continue to talk about, I mean, actually, you know, having his mother mourn for him gives him, you know, a, a much richer story as well. But so who is Rhesus, right? So when we first hear about Rhesus, even before he, he comes on stage in The Messenger, he's like the, he's the antithesis of the night and the darkness, right? He is making a lot of noise, first of all, as he's moving through, right? So he's not on an ambush, that's for sure. He's not trying to hide his presence. He's making a lot of noise, but he also is bright. He's got golden armor, right? So he's sort of shining in whatever light there is. His horses are described as snow white, right? So he's like lit up and making lots of noise as he comes in. And then, you know, we see him um, reject ambush tactics, right? And, and um, so there is this sense of um, those who, who won't, who, who do reject them are vulnerable to them, right? So if you're making assumptions um, that way. But there, there's two different versions of Rhesus as, a, as an ally in Troy. One is that it, he comes and he fights for one day and he causes so much damage on the battlefield that the Greeks have to assassinate him, right? And so that's not the order of events here but it is alluded to when Rhesus says, give me just one day of sunlight, right? So he says, all I ask for is to give me the sunlight of a single day and I'll have those towers of theirs torn down, right? And that, that alludes to this one tradition in which um, he does do that kind of damage in just one day. The other version that we hear about is that there was an oracle um, where if his horses, and so the, the stealing of the horses becomes important, right? If his horses um, drink of the Scamander and, you know, eat at Troy, then Rhesus is invincible and Troy won't fall. So we have these, these stories about these different allies who come late to Troy and, and whether or not they will prevent the Greeks from ultimately winning the war. And Athena talks about that um, when she's convincing Odysseus and Diomedes that that's what they need to do. She says, if this man survives the night, neither Ajax nor Achilles with their spears will be able to hold him back. He'll tear down all of your fences, right? So again, that's the other version where if he gets onto the battlefield, then the Greeks are done. And so the, his presence and his stakes really are important, even though we don't, we as a, as a non-traditional audience don't necessarily know that. <laughs> and I, I really like the way you're bringing it out because just mentioning those few things makes this seem like a much more integrated narrative, right? And, and also more integral um, to the Trojan War saga. And so we see the play not as a one-off where Euripides is just sort of toying with characters, but he's actually looking sort of a, 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 an inflection point, right? Where the war could go one way or mm -hmm. another, right? Um, so what, thinking of that, there, there's some other aspects in this um, that, that sort of trouble me. One is the characterization of Athena. Right um, now, Euripides, of course, is not one who's who's going to be pious in the face of the gods in every play, right? <laughs> um, but this seems like one of the more problematic Athenas that we see in Athenian tragedy. Um, what do you make of that? Yeah, so actually, she reminds me of the Athena in Sophocles' Ajax, right, where she's deceptive there too, um, in terms of you know, the, the people that she favors versus those she doesn't. And there she turns against an Achaean too. Um, and so, yeah, that, you know, we see that Athena is, you know, Odysseus and Diomedes are both favorites of Athena. And we see that in the Iliad, you know, version of this and that sort of thing. But I think the deception that she um, engages with with Paris does give it a, a an edge that you're talking about, right? right. Where Paris, right? Yep. I mean, it's hard enough for us to figure out what's going on here in the dark, and then to have gods come and and 
deceive yeah. you and mess with you. <laughs> I'm sure this can't be the only time, but I can't think of other times where one God imi where one God imi imitates another. That's yeah, that is. I mean, so we see them take on human forms all the time in epic, right? So they can they can appear um, as as humans, but to imitate a another God, I think, is really interesting. It, just, it seems like such a level of caprice. Uh, like, like, you know, like Athena had a fifth gear and then <laughs> boom, here's another one. You didn't know yeah. you didn't drive Athena. Um, and so I wonder, so, you know, when we get into a conversations like I'm about to, we're always in dangerous territory, but all along in these discussions, I've been trying to sort of feel out how the themes and content of the play would impact audiences, right? Mm -hmm. So with some plays we know it was at the end of the world for the Athenians. And now that we know it's near a victory. Um, but there are two things here that make me really wonder um, where the play sits. And that's the treatment of Athena. Mm -hmm. And then this theme about problems with alliances, mm. right? So, I mean, what do, you, what do you make? How do you think an Athenian audience in Euripides' lifetime would respond to these two themes? Yeah, so um, I think the whole, the question about, you know, what Athena is doing, what the gods are doing, right? So the, um, the guards there at the very end saying, why is it that the gods bring us such mi misery after such victory? What are they up to, right? And that whole sense of, again, uncertainty, um, of how to act and and so the Trojans have been winning 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 right and and now it's like but now what's happening right how could things change so quickly and so um you know I think that that um that would be something that depending on again what point in in the Peloponnesian War we're at right what kind of reversals um have have been experienced um, there was a whole episode over in Sicily that Thucydides talks about where there's a password issue, right? A stolen password. So even to have that in here in terms of... No, I mean, I'm sure there's much to be said about the language of passwords here. It shifts, but a lot of times, like several times the language uses SEMA, like, mm -hmm. right? And we know, I mean, in the Iliad, um, this can be a gravestone right? It can be a marker, right? It can also be an empty signifier, right? Yeah. That you add meaning to. And so right. there's some play with that in this play that I, I haven't quite figured out yet. Um, right. I'm trying to think about. Um, but this sort of idea that there's a hidden meaning, and if you know it, you can unlock the enemy. Um, so Euripides keeps getting interested in Trojan War characters, and especially identifies with Trojan women uh, <laughs> as we move along in the war. Right. Um, so I'd be tempted to put this in the Peloponnesian War, but I won't flirt with that anymore. Right. But I would like I would like to ask your view of Hector in this play. Right. So years ago, we talked about this before. When I first taught this, I thought this was a monstrous sort of flattened Hector. Um, right. We can talk to Tim about this later. He gave him some more depth and movement uh, and performance. It definitely comes out. Um, but what's your read on Hector in this play, and what what is he doing? Yeah, so I mean, we do get a very sort of blustery Hector, certainly. Um, but I, I think, again, that within Hector's story, this is his turning point or his inflection point, just as you were saying, right? And so, um, so how are we seeing Hector move toward his own downfall and his own death, right? So we have the death of Rhesus as the center of this, but I think in the background, you have Hector's own death looming, right, in our minds because we know at what point this is happening in his story. So uh, as we were talking about before, you know, this isn't, this isn't completely different from what we see with Hector in the Iliad in terms of once this victory is, seems in his grasp, right? He doesn't want to let it go and he doesn't want the war to just end. He wants to annihilate the Greeks, right? And so you have that desire to inflict greater damage, right? After all of your own suffering. And I think, you know, that can be a tragic theme too, right? That, that need for 
revenge or that need to, to cause suffering to those who have caused suffering to you is right. another theme that we see in Euripidean tragedy. Absolutely. And what, what I, so one of the things we talked about last week um, was sort of Hector as a, as a traumatized figure, right? Mm -hmm. Who 10 years finally gets the option to fight and then he just goes whole hog into it, right? He commits to it completely um, in the way that's almost natural. I yeah. think of us yeah. Do, right when we think about when we finally get to fight back like yeah. what are the limits right and Hector though in this place sets limits right like Rhesus comes in with all of that recent uh, swagger <laughs> it's like we're going to take this to Greece right them all out and Hector's like whoa right, right. that's a little too much for me <laughs> uh, <laughs> so to what extent do you think is Hector there then is this conversation offering the audience sort of a vehicle for the limits of, of payback, mm -hmm. for the limits of response? Yeah, so I think, you know, we do see again that there's this, um, there's this obscuring, right, that the, that the literal darkness is causing, and, and it has to do with sort of what, cloud, what clouds our judgment. When are we in the dark about um, what, what should happen next, right? And, um, and so we do see, you know, all of these arguments back and forth, like, oh, should we do this? No, no, we got to stop and, and think and maybe try this instead, right? Right from the beginning with Aeneas and Hector, and then Hector mm -hmm. and Rhesus, and then, you know, and the chariot driver who assumes it was the Trojans who killed Rhesus, right? We keep getting this confusion between who's our ally and who's not, yeah. right? And, and friend and foe. And, and so I think again, that it shows the limits of our knowledge and our judgment, right? And as a reason why we fall into, you know, uh, tragic circumstances. And I, I mean, and this theme is connected as well deeply with, with um, you know, the Oristia and mm -hmm. the Odyssey, right? This question of how far do we go um, yep. and when are things set or right? Um, so one, I mean, I, I, we could keep going, uh, but I want to bring the actors in a second. But first, um, the one thing that I still am struggling with, and this is, again, another typical Euripidean move, is that the last fifth of the play or more is occupied with the lament of the muse, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the invocation of characters like Orpheus, Musaius. Um, can you tell me why? <laughs> no, I know it's a little hard. Um, but it's such a radical tonal shift, right? So what yeah. does that do for you? And how do you think that, that it makes sense with the rest of the play? So again, I think having a mother come to mourn her son, you know, brings out all of the grief and sorrow of war, right? And that's where we see laments within the Iliad and, and the muse even points to Thetis lamenting Achilles later, right? So in some ways we get all of the, the deaths in the war sort of uh, it made equivalent, right? In terms of the sorrow that they cause mothers or loved ones, right? Um, but the other piece of her, um, her lament that rings so true to me is the anger that's in it, right? And how she wishes death on Odysseus and Diomedes and right and she blames Athena and there's you know the strong anger and that is what we see in the women's song tradition known as lament right that it's sorrow but it's also anger um, and that women themselves can use lament to call for revenge to you know continue conflict rather than you know end it right so I think it's similar to what you were saying before how far do we go Right, and lament as a, as a way of reflecting on the losses that war and other kinds of violence um, cause us. And yet it has the potential to um, keep it going, right? Like a vendetta rather than having the, the moment say, look, these losses are too great and we have to you know, stop now. So it's interesting in that it, I think engages with both sides of um, of what death in war can mean. And just one final question. I don't know if you know this, I don't. Um, but when she refers to sort of the cult tradition of Rhesus, do we have evidence that this existed outside of the poem? Was it something um, the audiences knew about? 
Yeah, so we do have um, rhesus in um, the, the much later work, the Heroicos. So there does seem to be a hero cult. In addition to these other traditions about him, there was also um, a romance tradition, right? And so again, there's, there's epiphanies. He's got all these stories. So this local traditions um, that would be uh, that would be connected with his hero cult in Thrace. Um, we do have other evidence of that. And so again, I think we see that Euripides is very good at, at knowing those local traditions and bringing them into his stories. Thank you. And uh, thank you for answering so many questions I didn't prep you for. <laughs> I, I knew you'd be good for them. All right. Um, so some of the actors can come back in now. And I think we'll... Um, uh, talk to Emma too in a little bit about the scene selection because I, I wonder about a few things. Um, but Evie and Tim, um, can I start with you too, if you're, if you're still there? Um, uh, we, we, Tabitha had to leave, which is unfortunate because I wanted to ask her how um, she made Reese's so cool. Um, but Evie and Tim, your Odysseus and Diomedes had me like bending over laughing hysterically. Um, <laughs> How did you make them so funny? Or what was in your mind? Does this come from the script? Was this an evil idea from Paul? Uh, what were you thinking? Yeah, I think there's always something really amusing about, you know, I think we imagine them to be slick. And I think it was kind of obvious that they were in the dark and trying to be covert and hidden and quiet, but still arguing and still kind of unable to kind of quite work out what was happening. I think there is an innate comedy in that isn't there watching these heroes just not that great at what they're doing perhaps. yeah <laughs> yeah just the the the, the kind of the, com the comedic um sort of potential of of missed identities and not being able to see in the dark and and not being sure and the idea that this is kind of the great Odysseus as well kind of reduced to a a, a fumbling fool is yeah. just, it's just kind of too juicy a uh, an opportunity to let pass really mm. i think <laughs> it, it seemed like like you were doing a comic version of oceans 11 but it's oceans 2 and they're completely <laughs> incompetent until they get a goddess in there um, so that definitely made me think it think of it differently because you know odysseus is so often seen as that master strategist right yeah. um, and here you're like oh wait and, and what I liked was a contrast in your incompetence, right? You know, because like, you know, Odysseus was kind of afraid, right? Your Odysseus was kind of cautious. And Diomedes was just like, I want to kill something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care who, I don't care when. <laughs> yeah, right. But I'll stay with you. For, but you also had the, the fascinating test this week of playing different characters. Um, so, you know, uh, Tim, you got to be Hector as well. Um, and Evie, you got to be everybody. Um, <laughs> and the muse. Um, so one, uh, you know, you, you got to play some strong, but kind of, uh, shallow characters, Tim, you know, people like Orestes. Um, yeah. what did you bring to Hector? What did you see as this Hector's sort of primary characteristics? Um, I, it's, it is, it is a very weird, like you've been saying, a very sort of weird tonal um, play tonally. And Hector, even, I mean, I, I, he's, he's kind of, he's, he's strong willed and he's, he's um, full of strong words, I would say, but, but even in this, play I get the sense that he's kind of slightly unsure of what he's doing and he's I mean I, I don't I don't know whether the the intention of Euripides in this play is to kind of just throw a different light on the war and the fact that it's all set at night and that they seem to kind of all be a little bit confused gives me the sense that it's it's a play that is intended to show the the difficulty and the kind of the chaotic nature of war that's maybe not always shown or or yeah sort of written about in in Homer's Iliad perhaps um, I don't know yeah no, well I like that because I mean in Homer there's no real strategy right I mean except maybe in the chariot games but other than that like you know a Homeric battle is you go 
you throw a spear and you miss, and then you throw a rock and you miss, and then you take your sword out and maybe you'll stab somebody, right? And that's just, you know, there's not much strategizing except maybe in this night scene. And, you know, for the Athenian audience, like you imagine the experience of a long war where people have great plans and we all know how well great plans go once they hit the battlefield. Um, so yeah. I, I like that. So this like mad, it's a madcap sorrow, right? Again, um, not to keep doing this, but bringing Euripides into that sort of Tarantino land where he goes to extreme to so show the absurdity of what, of what we think about real life. Um, yeah. So you guys did that really well. Now, um, Evie, um, you are Dolon and the Muse and Diomedes, which character was the hardest to play and which was the most fun? Oh, definitely <laughs> Dolon with the description <laughs> of the wolf skin. I mean, that's incredible, hilarious. Don't worry, I'll change into a wolf skin. Just some details, I'll be tying it around my waist. Is that okay? Like, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> really enjoyed that. Um, there's, also strange, there's also a strange, there's also a strange, well, Dolon's scene in the, the, the first scene, the, the repetition of the name Dolon is, it feels like, is, is this because no one is sure how to pronounce the name, <laughs> that they keep getting it wrong? Or... No, it means tricky, right? So that's why Hector says, oh, your name is, you know, yeah. just like your right. bodily nature, because the word dolos, so it's, it's spelled differently. It sounds a little different, right? But the word dolos, is uh, is trickery, deception, right? And it's something Odysseus is actually known for. So that's why Odysseus killing Dolon, right? Has a special. And so there's this thing going on where it's like, we're gonna send our trickster against yours, right? right. Odysseus at one point is called Dolomatus, right? Uh, clever, uh, cl or tricky uh, wisdom. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's part of what's going on there. And then that scene, you know, Mary, maybe you wanna uh, weigh in on this, uh, but the the putting on of the wolf skin, it's, it, incredibly meta theatrical. Yes. So, and it's it's much more elaborate. So we have animal skins in Iliad 10, right? It's it's something you put on at night. So more different people put on different animal skins and Dolan does put on the wolf, but here it becomes his costume, right? And it becomes his disguise and he's gonna play the wolf. And again, it's thinking like, oh, so if somebody sees him in a distance, they'll be like, oh, there's a wolf, I guess. I guess that's what they're supposed to think, right? Um, but theatrically speaking, what's interesting is the um, people have suggested maybe when Odysseus and Diomedes come on stage, one of them is wearing the wolf skin so that you get that visual that they've killed Dolon before is actually acknowledged right in the, uh, the dialogue that way. So that um, they, they're now the, the trickster figure as Joel was saying. Yeah. And, and I mean, and there's also, there's a, it's amazing and it's hard for me to really, to, to get my head around this as a homerist, how much we want to think of this as a type of performative intertextuality, right? Um, because what's absent from here is spelled out in what we have of the Iliad, um, which is Diomedes and Odysseus um, torturing Dolon to get the answer out of him and promising not to kill him and then of course killing him. Um, so I think I, I want to bring in both Emma and Paul for a minute, because one of the things that uh, our, our audience on YouTube is commenting on is what they're calling our Zoom craft, uh, which is sort of upping the game on the performance. Um, so first, before we talk to you guys about some of your performance decisions, I want to talk to Emma about the script, right? Uh, so th this play, in my humble opinion, doesn't have as many jewels as others, um, but it does have an interesting plot. So when you were going to um, sort of craft the narrative we saw today, um, what were you looking for? What were you picking up? Um, the preservation of maximum antics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. This, this play, and I've somehow in this series, I always end up making references to 90s animation. Um, I think I referred to Euri Euripides Orestes as being taught like uh, Pinky in the Brain back when we did it. This, parts of this play are pure Tom and Jerry um, for me in wanting and, oh, oh, sorry. There's a way that this play kind of pivots in and out of this, of this like real strange comic energy. Um, and I wanted to maximize as much of that as I possibly could. And then 
really was blown away uh, by the way that we kind of plunged into that like grief at the end. And Evie, like, thank you so much for the way that you really like brought that home because that passage is deeply weird. Um, and there's so much of this play that is so deeply weird. And yeah, the, the scene selections were made to preserve as many different stripes of that weirdness as we possibly could. Um, I was a little bit sad to lose the very end of the Odysseus and Diomedes scene where they kind of slip the guards because that's wonderfully silly and just a wonderful piece of stagecraft, but something had to go. Yeah, and I think, I mean, we don't know as much about some of the physicality of the actors in the ancient stage, but if we were gonna put this on a stage now, I would be looking for, you know, how menacing that scene is versus how vaudevillian um, we go with it. Um, so thank you. Again, you, you pulled out some themes in this play um, that I, I didn't necessarily see. And, and that, you know, Mary, I think we agreed when we were talking, it, it made that final muse scene hit so much harder. Right, it really supported it. Um, so Paul, um, this week you guys did a little bit with costumes, different stuff with the lights, casting the dual characters. Um, how much has the experience along the way um, made you rethink how to use the Zoom space? So can you comment on the Zoom craft that's getting the attention of some viewers? Um, well, I mean, I suppose every week we're sort of just trying to find kind of more and more ways of, of, of tackling things. and. I suppose sort of, you know, normally if you're, you know, if you're doing a Greek tragedy, but you're probably not going to be doing another one for a couple of years. So you wouldn't worry too much actually about finding necessarily that much difference between some of them, you know, just in sort of general staging, but actually because we're kind of going week to week and it's constantly trying to think, okay, what can we do now? What are our options? And the real option that kind of stood out for us this week is the fact that it's set at night. And just how, I mean, when I was reading it, I just, you know, it comes across as, as being, there being so much humour within it, and as we've all kind of said, there's such kind of strangeness within it as well. But then it feels then that what something that kind of brings that tension so strongly for everything and kind of gives us such um, clear stakes throughout is the fact that it's at night, and there is that opportunity for people being confused and not what's not sort of know quite who they're speaking to, and that's why then we were sort of we all sort of talked sort of I talked with the actors about you know what are our lighting options then. Um, and we sort of we all sort of have different things that we have in our houses. So when we when we sort of um, rehearsed yesterday, then we were just sort of kind of said, what have we got? You know, we've got sort of um, you know, some of them have only just got lights on our torches or candlelight. Um, and of course, Tabitha had a ring light um, and was able to kind of create amazing images with yeah. that. Um, so we're just constantly sort of trying to sort of I suppose transcend some of the difficulties of, of being where we are and being separate. But actually there's something really lovely about kind of going, okay, I've just got what's in my front room and now let's put on a tragedy and, and see where we can get to with that. And it feels that every week we're able to find kind of something different. Well, I, I must admit, I've, I've, I've got some other directors coming in over the coming weeks. And I should be quite pleased to kind of let some other people come up with um, ideas um, in the coming weeks as well. So we, we are today at episode 30, right? Give or take, depending on what we count. So we've, we've learned a lot along the way. And one of the things I think people watching this may not understand um, is that the actors don't just get up and read this, right? Um, they practice it beforehand. They work on thinking the lines, but they also get great background work from Paul and Emma. So Paul and Emma, like Paul, you've been performing this for a while. Emma, you're a translator on your own. You both have deep experience in this play. Um, before we move to our important announcements, um, Emma first, then Paul, um, how, has, how have the past few weeks as we move into now our fourth dec decade of performances, um, how, how has this experience changed the way you view ancient tragedy? So Emma first and then Paul. For me, it's been such a wonderfully affirming experience coming from a predominantly theatrical background um, where a lot of my work has been kind of standing on the theater side of things, trying to like prove like, no, this is really stageable, guys, it can be good. And everything I have seen has, everything I've seen and the amazing work that, that Paul and you and they, all of the wonderful actors that we've done, that we've had have confirmed that 
so so beautifully. I am I am a little bit smug and delighted to have been proven right. <laughs> um, especially with the deep cut plays, like especially with you know we've had and we've had like a streak of them over the past few weeks. These really rarely performed, rarely discussed plays that have been so alive on stage and so imminent, like so so close, so like emotionally resonant, so mentally resonant, so, and so funny and so vibrant. And I am just absolutely blown away by, by everyone every week. And yeah, I'm just, I'm going to sit back and be very, very happy to have been proven right. <laughs> well, I, I, for me, part of the pleasure has been proved, been proving, been proved wrong again and again from early on when Amy Pistone, who will talk to us soon, um, made me believe that the women of Trachis is not a terrible play. Um, to the seven against Thebes being absolutely riveting with the shield descriptions. Um, Paul, uh, you know, you, you have a good background in classics all the way around. Um, what, what have you gained um, as we've moved towards sort of the middle of the end of this year? Um, it's, uh, it, it's been really, it's been a really wonderful experience actually. And it's been really wonderful to kind of come back to these plays with Kind of with, I wouldn't say fresh eyes because my eyes don't feel very fresh right now, but with sort of <laughs> with with the now eyes anyway. Um, and and actually, one of the things that sort of has kind of recurred for me is just sort of actually how much lightness that you can find within the plays very often, and how well the plays respond to to lightness. There's so there's like an old kind of sort of acting maxim of sort of you play comedy as tragedy and tragedy as comedy. Um, and actually, there's sort of there seems to be sort of quite that quite a lot of truth within that. I think that's quite an effective way of of performance quite often. And I think that it's been really great for me, kind of working with uh, sort of we've had had nearly sort of fifty actors now, kind of um, across the series, and many of whom, well, it's probably most of whom, I've worked with in some capacity before, but then others who I've been introduced to, and it's just been really wonderful to get those people together, get different perspectives on what. And any individual play might mean and then create something kind of um all together with that and it's been yeah it's been it's been really kind of wonderful then because a lot of people have sort of got back to me afterwards that, that performers that is who've been in um, some of these episodes and it's been sort of you know one of their only experiences of working with greek theater and how much they've loved it and how relevant they feel it is and how much they sort of want to do more of it so it feels sort of that feels pleasing. Yeah, that's good. So, and uh, you know, again, I thank everybody for being involved in this. I'll thank the crew at the end. But we have a couple of announcements before we close. Um, I know Amy is here. Amy, do you want to join in and um, share some news with us? Yeah, I would. I would love to. Um, so a lot of this is Paul's Paul's creation, but I am happy to be the the voice of Paul's creation, which is that our Playing Medea competition has officially launched in the UK. Um, and so we will, I, I believe someone will put the, uh, the info in the notes when this is on YouTube. So you can you know, look down in the notes and like and, uh, like and subscribe and also find out the information for the production. But um, the deadline is going to be the 18th of, no of December. And the scene selections are going to be uh, from a translation that's being, that is used uh, in the UK. So we have a slightly different translation that we'll be using for those scene selections. All of that is up on the website. And uh, from the Classical Association has provided some funding. So there is going to be a first prize of 250 pounds and a trophy, which I, I was just learning when I looked at the, the updated website that we have a trophy involved as well. So there is Kleos and glory forever and ever. And um, there are second place prizes as well, uh, as well as participation prizes for everyone. So um, please go check it out. Tell your students, tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell everyone. Uh, we would love to see what everyone can put together. Uh, and I think that's it for my announcements. Um, so I, I just want to clarify that the trophy may or may not be a bronze cast of Paul's face. Is that what we're saying? No, I'm just kidding. So um, <laughs> this is the rollout of the UK version of playing Medea. And just to remind you that we have the ongoing US slash Canada division um, with our due dates, which is October 23rd for a performance. So you can go to- yes. uh, Coming up quick. 
right. so get get on those productions if you have not uh, if you have not yet gotten those together please uh, our, our UK or sorry our US and Canada deadline is coming up quickly and just as a reminder we had a generous anonymous donor who gave us uh, funding to give a special prize for Canada specifically so um, all of our Canadian friends, neighbors, colleagues, also enemies, um, you know, please, uh, please get involved. We would love to see what everybody has. Uh, and uh, if you are hesitating to enter because you have any questions at all, uh, you can email me or Paul or Amy um, and we'll all, we'll try to answer your question as soon as possible. Um, this week, we have a special edition uh, of Reading Greek Tragedy Online on Saturday um, and it's a comedy. So it's reading Greek comedy online. We are going to have uh, Aristophanes assembly women on Saturday. And I'm trying to figure out the time um, at, oh, what's the time? Is it 3 p.m.? 3 p.m. in the US. That makes it eight in the UK. There we go. And we are going to be doing most of the play, right? Is that, is that what we're doing? Maybe most of the play. The assembly women is about elections. It's about women taking over the state. Um, and it's a little not safe for work. Um, so if you have sensitive ears or children who watch this with you, you may want to skip this one, but you may not because it's hysterical, right? So Saturday, you can see us uh, doing the comedy at 3 p.m. or 8 if you're in the UK. Um, and next uh, Wednesday, we'll be returning um, with uh, Agamemnon's Aeschylus at the same time, 3 p.m. We're gonna do three weeks in a row with the Oristia, and we'll be using the same translation shared with us by Oliver Tapper. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Um, and hopefully it'll get us through the next three or four weeks or so. Um, which is something we may need. Uh, so I want to thank everybody who's been working with us and making this possible. Mary Ebbett, thank you for coming. Paul Amani, thank you for the, having the idea. The actors, you're wonderful. As usual, um, Amy, Emma, our production crew of Lana, Keith, Ellen, Janet, Sarah, um, our amazing poster designs by John Coley um, and um, Ali Marbury. Um, I thank you all. I'll see you either Saturday or Wednesday or both. Um, and until then, take care and stay safe.